This week on Talking Pictures with Neil Rosen, we'll look at the new World War I epic, 1917, a new film adaptation of the classic novel Little Women, the dramedy Uncut Gems, set in New York's Diamond District, starring Adam Sandler, and the Fox News drama Bombshell, with Charlize Theron, Nicole Kidman, and Margot Robbie. Plus, we'll take a look at some of our favorite movies of the year. We've got all that and many more movie picks coming up. I'm Neil Rose, and welcome to Talking Pictures. It's our monthly critic roundtable show where we debate what's worth watching and what's not when it comes to new releases, hidden gems, and Hollywood classics. Joining me are David Fear from Rolling Stone, Lisa Rossman from Signs and Sirens, and Bill McCuddy from Gold Derby. Now let's start out with a look at several new films hitting theaters this month, beginning with Uncut Gems, starring Adam Sandler as an addictive gambler who's in over his head. Let's take a look at a clip. I told you about how things were going to go. You like the way things are going now? That's my family! Get the kids out of the house! You having a good time? Yes. David, tell us about Uncut Gems. So I'm one of those Adam Sandler fans that I love it when he finds the right filmmaker to give him a nice chewy role, and man, this is it. He plays Howard Ratner. He works in the Diamond District off of 47th Street in Midtown Manhattan. He comes across this rare opal that he thinks is gonna turn his bad luck streak around. And the only problem is, is that he loans it to Kevin Garnett, played by Xbox and Celtics MVP. It's Kevin Garnett. I love Garnett. Uh, this is one of those He's perfect for the role. It's just like incredibly <laughs> relentless, almost to the point where it's so stressful. It is done by uh, Joshua and Benny Safdie, who are these two New York filmmakers that are absolutely wonderful. I think Uncut Gem is actually like a really great description of this film as well. It's absolutely beautiful. Lisa? Okay, the Safdie brothers to me are all means no end. And by this, I mean that they invariably make these movies that seem deeper than they are. The best thing that they do is they create amazing character studies. And that's what they did here. Adam Sandler turns in an amazing performance in what to me is a middling film. <laughs> um, the best thing about it besides his performance is the editing choices, which are actually off the chart. Like there's this crazy segue at one point from the opal itself to a colonoscopy oh. <laughs> that really <laughs> works. As much as I like things like this, I don't feel like this film advances my understanding about anything, and it, somehow I was more stressed out in a negative way than a positive one. Well, there's a lot of angst going on here. I mean, the guy is robbing everybody to pay everybody else, and he's doing it really, really stressfully. He's got a girlfriend, a wife, he's got kids, he's got Garnett, he's got this, these rap stars, he's going to concerts. He's in big trouble, he's being chased down. I think I agree with you, I like the movie a little more than you do, I'll tell you exactly how much later in the show, but oh, this yeah. is a, I think, great performance by him and we are sunk dead into the world of 47th Street so perfectly that uh, I got the, I got creeped out by watching this show. Listen, I, I'm with you, it, it is a remarkable performance and it's a dramatic role with darkly comedic, uh, you know, elements to it from Sandler. And listen, if you think about it, on paper, this is not a likable guy. This is a adulterer who is a compu you know, compulsive gambler. He's a, a degenerate guy. And, you know, <laughs> Sandler somehow makes you root for this guy. And, well, and, not and, entirely. And he also makes it funny. And I can't think of another actor who would actually be able to pull that off. And the only one who could compete with him on the screen is this newcomer who plays his mistress, who I think is quite good. But you can't take your eyes off Sandler. I will not give this away as a spoiler, but there's a 10 minute sequence near the end of the film that involves a basketball game that is just remarkable to watch. And the Safdie brothers, this whole thing is like a nonstop adrenaline, you know, express train that just does not stop and let up for two hours. I, it's a gem of a movie, pun I intended. I needed a colonoscopy at the end. Or a Xanax. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think it's terrific. Anyway, moving on, it's a, let's talk about uh, Richard Jewell, the, the per, not the person, let's talk about the movie, Bill. Well, Clint Eastwood, the kids still got it, uh, directs. <laughs> uh, this is the real life story of a security guard in 1996 at the Olympics during the bombing in Atlanta. Uber schlubby I, Tonya scene stealer Paul Walter Hauser <laughs> is uh, first the hero, then the suspect when reporter Olivia Wilde goes undercovers with the FBI's John Hamm to break the story that the tubby guy did it. His mom, Kathy Bates, cries foul, but the standout here, and it really is, is Sam Rockwell as the struggling lawyer who defends Jewel to the very end. He's the best thing in the movie. Historically I interesting and lightning. I forgot that 
that we, I, I forgot a lot of things <laughs> before I watched it, and uh, it's not the greatest movie this year, but I like it. Lisa? Okay, three words I never want to hear in tandem again. New Eastwood movie. I'm oh, come so, on. No, I'm so over this dude. I mean, come over on. and over and over, he seems to make these movies that are about the under siege, like God and country fearing, white male being victimized by evil institutions in some way. In this case, he nails them all, right? The media, bureaucracies, the government, and of course, women. Uh, I mean, you know that there isn't actually that much proof that the real Kathy Scruggs slept with the FBI yeah, to that's, get that scoop, that's troublesome. Which is very <laughs> troublesome. I mean, this is reinforcing all the patriarchal crap that does doesn't need reinforcement. I'm sorry. I got well, no patience. David? Her name, the character's name might as well have been Floozy J. Journal. Thank you! <laughs> the way she comes off is this Thank kind you. of like flighty daffy. I'm gonna oh sleep. So you didn't like Olivia Wilde's performance? I didn't like anything about this written. movie. Really? I don't I like the fact movie. that, I, like, I hate the fact that Clint Eastwood, who is a director, he has a lot of qualities that I admire, is essentially making this movie just so he can shake his cane at institutions he's angry at. This There's a shot in this film movie. where the po you can see a poster in the background that says, I am more scared of government than I am of terrorism. <laughs> and then talk about burying the lead <laughs> there. He's got a bone to pick <laughs> with that and the media and the yes. FBI, and that's all this film is for two hours. It's not even about the guy the whose name is on the title. Who, by the way, I would have thought was a terrorist. The FBI wasn't wrong to investigate him. They just, it's just a... You know, badly told no, listen, I, man ramrod. Listen, I've, I've, I've got to admire the fact that at 89 years old, despite your feelings, Lisa, that Clint Eastwood is still directing movies, and I think he's a good storyteller, but I appreciate the fact that I knew the story, that the government and the media ruined this guy's life for a while, but there was something, I was not as emotionally connected to this movie as I should have been, and I don't know if that's a fault of um, the star of the movie, Paul Walter Hauser, who plays this kind of like, like as a cross between Seth Rogen in, in Observe and Report, and Kevin James from Mall Cop, which this whole thing kind of has, like, you know, he's just frustrated. A little I want, better than both of those. No, well, he's actually really good. It's just a bad yeah. script. Well, yeah. I, I just wasn't connected to the thing as, as much as I could have been. But that said, you know, I mean, it, 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 it's perfunctory. It's okay. I knew the story, so maybe that had some reason why I wasn't drawn into as much as I should have. But again, I give props to Clint, Clint for still making movies. It's an okay film. It's just not a great that film. Is for that, endurance. No, that's ridiculous. Like, oh, I'm so, he's 110. Let's, I'm uh, proud of him. Filmmakers make movie. political statements. As Calm I said down. earlier, Sam Rockwell is the best thing in the movie. You've ruined this man's life. Next up is Bombshell, Lisa. Okay, I am shocked to say this. This is my favorite film of this block. I honestly thought I would have no patience for it. It's about how the women of Fox News took down CEO and sexual no, predator, Roger Ailes. First of all, it didn't help to me that it's mostly men who created it. Jay Roach directed, Charles Randolph wrote it, and it's definitely not perfect, especially a compositional fictional character played by the grating Margot Robbie. But the key here may be uh, Charlize Theron herself, who produced it. She is outstanding as the controversial Megyn Kelly, who, along with Bridget and Carlson, played here by Nicole Kidman, also really good, confronted the behemoth, and I do mean behemoth, of sexual ails, sexual harassment. The movie pulls no punches in terms of acknowledging these women's biases. Their snappy editing, the dialogue is really good, and I thought the acting was very old school screwball dame in a way that worked. To me, this is a newsroom thriller about how sexism doesn't tow lines, even uh, political ones. Listen, I want to tell you that I give props to Charlize Theron for, I mean, and the makeup department. I mean, she really does look like, like Megyn Kelly, and they get a lot of credit for this. But, Bill, you used to walk, work for Fox News. So I, I live there. Insight, I mean, yeah. you, you have an insight into this that yeah, most people take? would not have. It gets a lot of things right. Uh, the, the look and feel of it, I think, in some ways is better than the Showtime uh, series that we just had called The Loudest Voice. However, uh, if there's a weak point here, it's the Yale's character himself, who I think is much better as Russell Crowe than uh, here as John Lithgow. And this is much more a, a movie about the women, and I think in that way it succeeds. Unfortunately, it has an amalgamated character in Margot Robbie yeah. who isn't really based on one individual person, but a lot of different people. And I think that does it a disservice. But I thought I was watching the real Megyn Kelly when I saw this thing. So for good or for bad, I give it... Uh, Charlize is great. You, yeah, she's amazing. Okay. And, you, and you, you'd recommend the film? I do recommend the film. The, Charlize Theron is good, but I think we need to shout... Well, you talked about the makeup department. Really, the shout-out needs to go to Kazuhiro, oh, who was the yeah. same makeup department prosthetics guy that did Winston Churchill. Uh, I turned Gary Oldman into Winston Churchill in The Darkest Hour, and he's doing a lot of the heavy lifting here. I mean, she really is unrecognizable. I think the problem is is that this just kind of comes down to the same sort of important social issue cosplay thing where you're so taken up with how X person looks like Y Fox News affiliate that you kind of stop getting, it keeps taking you out of the film. And this whole idea of making Megyn Kelly like this, you know, feminist free speech advocate 
just feels so incredibly false to me given how much of a role she played on Fox News during her heyday. I think it's, it's just Look, bull. Here's my problem with this. And I mean, it's an okay movie, but I had seen The Loudest Voice, which you mentioned, Bill, which was the seven part miniseries on Showtime. And I think Russell Crowe was a much better Roger Ailes. Well, and I think that Naomi Watts was a much better Gretchen Carlson. And it was so much more comprehensive. And I understand this is not their story. This no, is the Megyn Kelly story. But that said, I wish I saw a Bombshell movie. first, because having seen The Loudest Voice first for seven hours, where they can really get into so much more detail, this was like watching, you know, reading a Reader's Digest version of the same story. That said, it's an okay movie, but it's also too light. This movie is more about the women and how they got screwed over. And for me, this was a very important film to watch that I felt sympathy for women I didn't expect to feel it for. 1917 is the name of a new drama that takes you into the trenches of World War I. Let's take a look. We've got orders to cross here. That is the German front line. Oh, if we're not clever about this, no one will get to your brother. I will. David, tell us about 1917. So you have these two World War I infantrymen who are given a mission. They have to find this platoon that is several clicks over to the east and warn them not to go on this morning attack because it turns out it's an ambush. Now, this probably sounds like every other World War I film you've seen, except there is a big difference in that director Sam Mendes and cinematographer Roger Deakins have constructed it to look like it's one continuous shot from beginning to end. And with the exception of one part where it's pretty obvious where they can like cut away with like during a blackout scene, uh, it has the illusion of this one continuous shot, which is great for suggesting the relentlessness of war, but is a kind of formal exercise that makes you, basically eclipses the story. I kept thinking about how impressive that shot was and kind of forgot what was going on in the narrative. Uh, yeah, the technical aspects of this film, plus it looks gorgeous. Uh, sort of do dust under the carpet that this story is, you know, well told, but we've seen it kind of before. I'm kind of World War One'd out. I mean, it, nothing's going to be better than Paths of Glory for me. I'm sorry. So uh, this is there's nothing new here for me, Lisa. I'm with the boys for once. I mean, the the crack, in the trenches. The film. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in the. <laughs> well, it takes you into well, the, the boys. The literally hole. puts you in no, the trenches. The, the filmmaking is technically excellent, but at a certain point, I started wondering if every prestige filmmaker of a certain gender, it race, mess, age. Yeah. <laughs> older white men thinks they now have to make their own Dunkirk, basically. I mean, can we move on? Or are they only really making these movies set more one so they have an excuse to make movies that are only about white men and no women have any lines whatsoever? Well, I agree with you all on the brilliance of the technical achievement. I don't know how they pulled this thing off. I mean, I kept saying, where are they going to cut this, except for that one part that you mentioned, David? It just It's like that scene in Goodfellas, um, the five-minute one-shot tracking thing. It's like right. a two-hour version. I wish or I more like, Goodfellas. More like Hitchcock's Rope, where you're going, when the hell are they going to cut here? But <laughs> I, but you know, yeah. it's also like watch. It's it's like watching a video game, and it made me dizzy. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Oh, but Nico, I do, we know when you get it, dizzy, it's mm. no good. But it, it did, uh, so you know, true. as I said before, feel like you were in the trenches. And I think this actor, who's not done a lot of work, who's the star of the movie, George McKay, really gives a good performance. And I was absorbed into the story. But you want to know, you should watch this film and then follow it up with this companion piece of a documentary that came out earlier this year by Peter Jackson called They, they Shall Not Grow Old, old where you see the real no, thing. And, 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 and it, it's so the real thing looks so much like what Sam Well, I'll go a step further. You don't need to see 1917. You can just <laughs> no, the watch Peter that Jackson movie. Well, it's a fascinating yeah. companion piece, and it, and it actually adds more substance to it because he gets more brutal on it, Peter Jackson, with this real footage of showing you how bad the conditions were. The sanitary conditions were awful. The whole thing was just, you know, I think back to back they're good. But I, I think you got to you got to be dazzled by what Sam Mendes did. Next one we're going to talk about is something called the Song of Names. Bill. Director Francois Girard, who gave us 32 short films about Glenn Gould a long time ago, tells an epic story of friendship and betrayal when a nine-year-old Jewish violin prodigy is taken in during World War II by non-Jews in London. He befriends the family's son and at the age of 21 is supposed to make his concert debut, but vanishes. The boys grow up to be Tim Roth and Clive Owen and the search begins. Why did he disappear? Where is he? Can he still play? The actual song of names is a way the Jews remembered those who were killed in the Holocaust. So the cause is noble, but this is a noble misfire. Uh, I don't agree with that at all. I love this film, but I'll chime in with my opinion, more of my opinion in a moment, David. Yeah, I liked this film when I saw it in the 90s and it had a Miramax label slapped in the front of it. I can't believe they're still making these kind of middle-brow dramas about this sort of stuff. If you like Francois Girard's films, I do quite a bit, you should really check out The Red Violin. 
It's a much better film about musicians. I'm more torn about this film than you guys are, and I do think it's because I'm Jewish. Honestly, I was very affected by the concept of the Song of Names, and I think that the music is a real star here. It's wonderful, and I like the screenplay. Uh, Jeffrey Kane, who wrote Constant Gardener, did an able job. The problem for me, honestly, is that the pacing's a little slow. The acting is very, I'm surprised. This is the most inert performances I've ever seen from either Clive Owen or Tim Roth, and the cinematography is so painterly. Okay, well, David and Bill, I couldn't disagree with you more. I think this is a moving, stirring, and beautiful film, and Francois Girard um, gets across, it's a movie really, it's not a movie about music. It, it is to some extent, yeah. but Oscar winner Howard Shore did the score, and it's beautiful. It's a movie about faith, anti-Semitism, and friendship, and it's also, uh, Gerard gets the point across that we should never forget. The scene when you find out what the song of, the title, the song yes, of names yes, means, said. is such, so moving and emotionally powerful. I think Tim Roth and Clive Owen are quite good, and I think the young nine-year-old child who plays the Jew from the Warsaw Ghetto, who's lucky enough to go to London, and where he doesn't know if his family survived or not after the Holocaust, I think he gives an, a remarkable performance. And there's a 21-year-old version of him, too. That guy is good, too. I love the film. What can I say? I highly recommend the Song of Names. Moving on, there's a new screen adaptation of the classic Louisa May Alcott novel, Little Women. This one's directed by Greta Gerwig. Here's a clip. This is Meg, Amy, Beth, and Joe. I intend to make my own way in the world. No one makes their own way. Least of all a woman. You'll need to marry well. But you are not married, aren't you? Well, that's because I'm rich. Lisa. Well, there have been many, many screen, TV, and stage adaptations of uh, Louisa May Alcott's beloved Civil War era YA novel. It is a YA novel about four Massachusetts sisters who are rich in love and poor in finances. But to me, this is the most ravishing one yet, and it's the first that really doesn't betray the intense feminism of the author. It's directed by Greta Gerwig, who did Lady Bird, um, and it, star it has an intensely good cast, including oh, Shersa Ronan, Laura Dern, Timothy Chalamet. The storytelling is less conventional. It's told sequentially out of I'm order, which may know. upset certain people. I, I like that. I did too. I thought that actually strengthened the fact. It's very hard to tell the story in two hours. That helped. And uh, it's tremendous acting, cinematography, the costume and set design is really good. But to me, what I love about it most is that it captures the book's warmth and wit, um, but it also, for the first time in any of these adaptations, acknowledges what has always been Alcott's underlying message, which is that a traditional happy ending for women is basically fiction, and it precludes any economic <laughs> or personal freedom. I think that the movie has a beautifully ambiguous ending. I you like that not only Amy. Oh, sorry. I'm a, I was I'm a Jamie. Say, <laughs> I'm a Jamie. <laughs> right up to the hair. Yeah, the hair is, I did this <laughs> hair, you done. guys, for Little Women. This go is ahead. How they, no mod. Yes, go ahead, Listen, Bill. this is not, I'll just say this, it's not only one of my favorite movies yeah, of the so year, good. I think it's probably one of the best adaptations ever done. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this complaint that it jumps around too much is makes it far more interesting to me and yes, much yes, more yes. like the novel. It's wonderful. These crybabies who were saying, I can't pay attention, I should put their phones down and look up at the screen. I agree with what you. What you said, I can't believe I'm agreeing with you, but yeah, yes. David. Yeah, I think the chronology actually breathes life into this, uh, this story that's been told a lot of times, but I'm with you guys. It's one of my favorite literary adaptations of the last decade, so and uh, we should really shout out Florence Pugh, who is absolutely wonderful in a supporting role in this. Yeah, Meryl Streep is also in this as supporting role and she actually steals every scene that she's in but I have to tell you you know before I saw this this has been this is the seventh version of this particular movie and I going in I was like oh no I, I've seen four of them already I'm like what can they possibly add that's new to this when this was published in the late 1800s this had a lot of radical feminine feminist themes that seem actually so relevant today yes. and Gerwig sometimes subtly sometimes not so subtly actually gets those points across mm -hmm. and I thought Tim Timothy Chalamet was terrific I think he was wonderful I think the ensemble cast was great Chris Cooper is as the uh, is the, the neighbor is, is, is good. Yeah. You know, it's a tremendous adaptation my only and, concern Neil is that young audiences will go to this and not believe how kind and good these people are <laughs> Well, it's the end of the year, and time doesn't allow us to do a full 10 best list, 
but we're going to go around the panel and count down our top three films of 2019. Kick it off, Lisa. What's your number three pick? Uh, the Souvenir, uh, Joanna Hogg's uh, brilliantly withholding movie about a film student's relationship with a gaslighter extraordinaire. All right, David, number three pick, go. The Irishman, Martin Scorsese's beautiful mobster epic that's also an elegy to the genre. It's great how he took his gangster movies and his spiritual movies and put them together in one big three and a half hour epic. Well, well that movie is still a, playing and no, I don't, that, I'm not gonna finish it, I'm <laughs> sorry. He just expressed that brilliantly. I, I think it's a, it, you, you must see the movie if you're a Scorsese fan, but it, it is a bit too long and no. could could have been cut. All right, what's wrong your and wrong. What's this is a, a little uncut gem, and it's called Queen and Slim. Uh, it's uh, get this first date. It's get out uh, Daniel Laclea and uh, Jody Turner Smith kill a white cop and go on the run. Uh, this pushes a lot of really interesting social buttons and hits the bullseye. And I just think it's one of the best movies. You know, of the year. it's like the other the flip side of the Hate You Give. I think from last but year, but immensely better than that. No, I love the Hate You Give better, but it's a very good movie. I support what y'all doing. It was self defense. Power to the people. My number three pick uh, is Uncut Gems. And we talked, I don't know what I could add to this that we haven't seen earlier, but, uh, but you'll watch try. That. As I said, well, you know, <laughs> tell me Adam forget. Sandler doesn't Neil. deserve Never an Oscar forget. when you watch the last 10 minutes of that movie. All right, number two pick of the year. Go ahead, Lisa. Oh, mine is Us. Jordan Peele's sophomore exactly effort, more like demanding us. than the last maybe, but also more rewarding. I don't know. I think Get Out was better, yeah. but Us is good. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Pete is good for the one character and over the top for it's the other good one, pick. I think. You people. It's us. All right, I don't care what right. he says. It's a good pick. It's a good movie. I said it's a good pick. I just I think it's moving on, boys. All right, moving on. Give me your number two pick of the year, David. Parasite. Woo! South so Korean good. filmmakers, Bong Joon Ho's yes. masterpiece, and yes, the M word masterpiece about class warfare is. Not only as good as the hype, I think it exceeds the hype. It's uh, a genius film. He's yeah. right. Do you think it'll get nominated for Best Picture in the non-foreign language category? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Yeah, we'll yes. Talk that in our Oscar show, which is the next show that we're going to do. Bill, number two pick. Go ahead. Well, I hate to repeat anything you say, but uh, <laughs> yes, you, it's you, 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 uh, Uncut you. Gems, and for all the reasons we've been talking about, uh, including that it's the most unexpected turn from Adam Sandler, probably in his career. The best he's done since Punch Drunk Love. Okay, <sighs> so listen to my number two pick. It's it's Dolomite is my name. Eddie Murphy has not been this profane in years, and what a welcome return. Playing this real-life stand-up comic frustrated filmmaker, Rudy Ray Moore, trying to get a movie done, and uh, he's not only funny, Eddie Murphy, but he also infuses the character with heart and determination. Set in the 70s, attention to period details, great, and I just love it, this movie about a guy who never gives up. What you do to your hair? You look like a pimp. It's all pretend. I just created a character. You loved it, Bill. I love Dolomite. I, I think the script is a little weaker than it could have been, and uh, I think Eddie Murphy takes it rises the the whole thing above. It's a great, it's a great, great. Uh, I think it's a great Netflix movie. Ensemble honestly. movie. I don't think it's, one it's of the on best. Netflix. That's what I'm saying. Wesley Snipes that's is my, not as good as they point. say. I think it's one of the. I don't think it's one of the you best like of the year. I love everything. Okay. I love everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love you, Neil. All right. Okay. I love, I never forget I love that. that. Okay, we're gonna do our number one picks of the year. Go ahead, Lisa. Your favorite movie of the year is Little Women. Are you surprised? I just. I fell over it. I love the movie. I changed my hair for it. <laughs> okay, uh, David, what is your number one? I did not change my hair for this, but I should have. Pain and Glory. Oh, I love, that, love that, movie. that movie. Autobiographical story about an old elderly filmmaker <laughs> looking back, and it's the best thing both he and Antonio <laughs> Banderas have done in like 10 years. So I, I, so, I so agree. I, I so agree. It, it, it is. It, uh, exactly. Took the words right out of my mouth. What a great movie. What's your number one pick? Well, I didn't want to risk the hairdo, because, and I don't really look good as Adolf Hitler. My number one movie <laughs> is Jojo Rabbit. Nice. And Woo. which is so all over the map in terms of tone, and it's one of the bravest movies of the year. I think uh, the performances are great across the board. Uh, Scarlett Johansson is heart wrenching, and uh, it's about a, a boy who hi whose parents are hiding, or his mother is hiding, uh, a Jewish girl in World War II in their house. Uh, he happens to be German and worships uh, Hitler. It's uh, it should be girl. terrible, and it's amazing. Hi, Adolf. What's wrong, little man? They call me a scared rabbit. George rabbit. Let them say whatever they want. Well, my best movie of the year is Marriage Story, and which should really be called Divorce Story. And uh, writer-director Noah Baumbach uh, has made a film that feels so real and so raw and so powerful. This huge fight scene that the couple, Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson, have towards the end of the movie is one of the most powerful scenes I've seen in a movie in a long time. It's hard-hitting, it's jaw-dropping, it's not a happy film, but it's a great one, and it's now on Netflix.
It's overrated, but Laura Dern is going to win. And I say it's overrated, it's in my top ten, but Laura Dern is going to win Best Supporting Actor. I wish that there was a separate movie that was really about the fights that were going on between Ray Liotta and Laura Dern. That <laughs> movie I would have been super into. All right, very quickly, worst film of the year. David, worst film of the year. Last Christmas, which oh, is not fine. just a lump of coal in your stocking, but one up your rectum as well. <laughs> Last but it's the most heartfelt of okay, the bad movies Okay, I feel movies like you ever. boys are going to come down on me, but Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was my least favorite what? film of the year. It is oh, the come most on. Let me finish the oh, sentence. Just, Excuse me, let me talk. The most Not overrated film of 2019 <laughs> from the most overrated director in oh Hollywood. God. It's all about nostalgia for the battle days when everyone but the good old boys knew their place. Thank you. No, a hateful film that reinforces patriarchy. I hate it. Okay, you, just, well, you just you just hate Quentin Tarantino. No, that's not true. I hate patriarchy. Uh, I like the film. It. It's no Pulp Fiction or Inglorious Bastards, but it, it, it it's really a good film. Ugh, so overdone and Bill, bloated. Come on, back okay, me up. well back on that me up. point, I mean, it, this is going to get ugly, but I think Parasite is uh, the wor one of the worst movies of the year. Wow. Because it I takes love rich an people, incredible, by incre no, it takes an incredible, <laughs> what? It, it takes an incredible <laughs> setup and squanders it. It turns into a John Carpenter kind of a slasher movie just because one guy doesn't like the way the other guy smells. Wow, do you I, not I get that film? I'm I, sorry. I totally got it. I just you got like, it. That's like being like Wizard of Oz is all about flying monkeys. I don't like <laughs> it. No stars. Okay, my worst film of the year is something called The Dead Don't Die, which I was really Ooh, looking so forward bad. to because I like Jim Jarmusch as a filmmaker, but he's making a zombie film, and what a waste of talent. Yeah. I mean, so Adam Driver, right? Bill Murray, right. Tilda Swinton. How do you have these people in a movie? And I mean, my bold. wife walked out of the movie out of boredom. I, of course, couldn't do that because I was reviewing the film, but it was an endurance contest to sit through. I don't know what this thing was. Is it funny? Is it a dr zombie movie? It's just the worst, and I hated so it. So just to be clear, your wife walked out of the living room into the dining room? No, we went to no, a the, screen. The uh, film is a stinker. I agree with you. It's a yeah. stinker. Anyway, that's Neil, about... would you say it's undead on arrival? It's... <laughs> <laughs> this is really awful. Maybe the worst thing I've ever seen. That's about all the time we have, and I want to thank David Fear, Lisa Rossman, and Bill McCuddy, and I'm Neil Rosen, and join us next time on our Oscar show, Prediction Show, on Talking Pictures.